What's going on traders? It's Chris at Verlo Trading. Welcome to this video. Thank you for joining us. In this video, we're going to talk about problem solving. I wanted to kind of address some common myths that people often have. I often get a lot of questions in the comments section asking about various ways to solve different problems using certain trading software. Normally, it's TWS software, interactive broker software. Um, so basically, I'm going to kind of just give you guys sort of a gist on my opinion on these things and also after that, I'm going to go over something that I was able to do in Sierra Chart, something that I've been spending my time on this week um, doing, sort of hacking the volume at price containers in Sierra Chart to create my own volume profiles. It was kind of a fun experiment. It's not finished yet, but it looks pretty much like I'm getting the right result here and I'm not printing any garbage value. So I'll show you that here in a second. If you enjoyed this content, click the like button, comment down below and just uh, do whatever you can. Support the channel. Click on the first link in the description. Thank you for watching. Okay, so I often get these questions in my comment section about TWS software from traders, probably new traders that don't really understand that every single problem that you have to overcome when it comes to trading and constructing a trading system of some kind is a unique problem. And there's also no guarantee that your trading software is able to solve that problem for you. In fact, most of the time, it, the more niche the problem is, the more specific you want to get with your execution or the application of a certain thing in your trading system, the more specific it is, the less likely it is that your trading software can do it, right? So I'll often get these questions like this. So here's one of them. Trader asking about automatically adjusting trade position quantity based on the price of a derivatives contract, an options contract. So they said something like, if the options price is a um, dollar or less, then I want my position quantity to be, I don't know, three contracts. And then if the options price is $10, then I only wanna trade one contract, right? That is not natively supported in the TWS software. And most things like that are not. What you're doing is you're creating a solution for a problem that you have and you're asking the software to solve a very specific problem. It doesn't support that. You have to go into the API and code it yourself, okay? So unfortunately, that's the way it is. Now, I don't really do any work with the TWS API currently. Um, I found it very kind of tricky to do, especially in C++, because that's kind of what I've been working with lately. Um, so most of the stuff I do is in Sierra Chart. So I'm gonna show you some stuff I've done in Sierra Chart towards the end of this video. So if you are interested in looking at some code uh, for creating volume profiles and stuff, which is kind of what I've been doing this week, um, this is what it is here on the um, right side of the screen. So the, the general consensus of that is that I just wanted to explain to you guys that every single problem is unique and there is zero guarantee you're gonna be able to solve it given the native tools that your trading software supports. So now let's go on here. I'm gonna show you a problem that I wanted to solve this week and I'm gonna to explain to you the problem from start to finish and then how I solved it from start to finish. Now, to be honest with you guys, I broke my head on this for a few days um, and uh, I also wasted a lot of mental capital on it, um, which is fine, I tend to do that. Um, but we seem to have solved it, so I'm pretty happy about that right now. So what I was essentially trying to do is recreate my volume profile and the volume profile that I use for a reference is a very specific volume profile. I'm gonna to explain to you what that is. So the software you're looking at here is Sierra Chart. I use this software for trading and this software has a lot of advanced functionality for volume by price and tick by tick data. And you can basically examine the volume by price at every single price point and you know, do whatever you need to do with that. So if you look at this volume by price here, you can see here we're, we're seeing a representation of uh, some volume at price, a volume profile. But this volume profile is set to a specific time frame. So I'm going to go into the study settings of my chart and show you what those settings are. So it's this right here, volume reference, single volume by price for the last four bars. So if you look at here, we're going to see number of bars based on bar count four. So what this profile is showing us is the volume profile of only the last four bars on the chart. And as the chart makes new bars, the volume from the previous bar that is outside of our four bar range is getting deleted. It's no longer included in the profile, okay? Now, what I wanted to do essentially is recreate this volume profile in my own code, in my own study in Sierra Chart. And the reason for that, I'll explain to you why I wanted to do that, because it was a lot of work, is because in Sierra Chart, this study, the volume by price here, look how many subgraphs are on this study. Now, one thing that is a fact about subgraphs in Sierra Chart, and they even state this in our documentation, is that even if the subgraphs are set to hidden or ignore, the calculations being done for the subgraphs are still being calculated in the background. Therefore, those things are technically 
slowing down your chart a little bit, even if it's by a few milliseconds. So I have all of these extra little subgraphs that are included in the volume by price study, like mean price plus standard deviation or volume peaks and valleys, etc. All these extra subgraphs here are actually being calculated, even though I'm not drawing them on the chart, they're being calculated in the background, okay? Now, maybe I'm not 100% sure because CR chart doesn't disclose their code for the volume by price and for the numbers bar studies. Maybe it's possible that when the studies are set to hidden, that the calculations are not being performed, but that would not be consistent with what's written in the documentation, which is the opposite of that. Those subgraphs are still being calculated in the background, even if they're hidden away. Right, after doing many A-B tests with charts with no studies on them in a separate installation of Sierra chart or a separate instance compared to a chart with my normal studies on them and slowing down the recording to potentially 25% speed, I found that the chart with no studies was always faster, always faster by a few milliseconds. And for me, this makes a big difference and I'll tell you why, because sometimes in my trading, I use something called a client side condition to send limit orders to hit the bid or hit the offer anticipating that the bidder offer is gonna disappear or gonna be gone by the time uh, my order is filled or basically soon after my order is filled. So I'm trying to send the limit order to hit the bidder offer anticipating that it's gonna be gone. And it's not just a limit order, sometimes it can be a stop order as well. And what can happen is if your client side is slower, you're going to get slippage if it's a stop order, you're gonna get slippage. And then for the limit order, you're not gonna be filled in the case that you were right on your anticipation of as soon as that offer disappears, it goes bid and then it continues. If you were right about that, your limit order is not gonna be fast enough to essentially get in the trade and you're not gonna get filled on the trade. So what I'm essentially doing here is I'm splitting hairs and I'm trying to make my chart as fast and as optimized as possible for client side execution. Some of you might think I'm absolutely fucking crazy because I'm a retail trader trading from my apartment, but from the A-B tests I've done, there's a difference there. And if I can perceive a difference in the price action when I slow down the recording, then it means that my computer can also perceive the difference because the computer obviously is much faster than you are. So basically my goal was to replicate this volume by price in my study without having to have this volume by price study on the chart. So I'm trying to reduce the number of DLLs that are on my chart in any given moment when I'm trading. So essentially this volume by price study here would not be necessary once I'm finished doing what I'm doing. The reason it's on my chart right now is because I'm using it as a reference to make sure I'm getting the correct values. So now let's start. Now that you understand what I was trying to do, you can see what I've accomplished thus far. Okay. Now this is what I was trying to get out of these profiles. So for these four bar profiles, I need three values from them. I need the point of control, that's the first one, which is the price that has the highest volume. I needed the value area high and the value area low of that four bar profile, okay? Now those are three values that I wanted to try to get in my own code by going into the CR chart VAP containers, okay? And I've done that, I'm gonna show you how I did it, I'm gonna show you all the code from start to finish, the insane amount of problems I went through and everything. And that's it, so right now what you are seeing is this. My study, which is this one right here, volatility overlay bond trader, is drawing these two lines right here, this green line and this green line right here. Now, the number here being recorded on the price scale, that one is actually coming from the volume reference um, study. It's set to show the value area low and value area high. It's just to test to make sure I'm getting the right values. And as you can see, my calculations seem to be pretty much matching up with the ones being thrown from the volume by price study maybe off by a tick or two. And I notice sometimes that my calculations are even leading the uh, volume by price study by a little bit, which is interesting. So what I've essentially done is I've taken the raw data from the volume at price containers for the last four bars, and I've constructed my own calculations for the value area high and low and for the point of control, okay? And I've done a lot of tests on this before filming this video to make sure I was getting the right values. And you might see sometimes it's not perfectly lining up, um, which it makes sense. And you know, sometimes you'd be splitting hairs to make sure you're getting it at exactly the right ticks. But for me, I'm concerned with the fact that as long as I'm not printing any garbage values and I'm not getting totally inaccurate, as long as I'm like within one tick, I'm good generally. And another test I did was I tested this on the bond uh, symbols, which sometimes have less volatility. 
um, and I noticed that the tests were fine there as well. So let's go over to the code now and basically look at what is going on. So the first thing is I needed to determine the highest and lowest price in the four bar range that I am going to be iterating through. And the reason for that is because I, I'm using this function right here, if you go down lower, sc.volume at price for bars, get vap element for price if exists. Now, this function requires a price in ticks. So the way I thought of doing this was I want to get the four bar price range, the lowest price in ticks, the highest price in ticks. And price in ticks is an integer. It's not the actual floating point price. And I wanted to perform this function on every single price and get the VAP element for each price in that four bar price range and then look at them and then save them. So basically what I ended up doing in this case is I saved them to an array that is set to the size of the four bar price range. Okay, so that's essentially what I've done. So let's go through the code step by step. What I've done is I started by initializing these variables, lowest price and highest price, and I just set them to the low and the high of four bars in the past, basically. But these are going to be initialized anyways, in the following for loop over here. The next thing is I set up two more variables for the high and low, but in ticks this time, not the actual floating point price values, because we need those integer values to conduct our calculations coming up here. So the next thing I do is I have a for loop that iterates through the four bar range. So bar index is equal to SC update start index, which is set to SC array size minus four. And what we're doing is we're iterating through those four bars and we are checking here if the highest price, which is this variable right here, is lower than the high of the current bar in the current iteration, then it will reset the variable to be the high of the current bar. And the same thing is for the low. So if the lowest price here is lower than the low of the current bar on the current iteration that we're on, then we need to reset the variables to be that new low. So what this essentially does is by the time this for loop finishes, um, these two variables here, lowest price, highest price, and also these ones, low in ticks and high in ticks, are going to be set to the correct values of the high and the low of the four bar specified price range from the current bar to four bars in the past, okay? Now, the reason I chose four bars is arbitrary. It's my own personal choice. You can do whatever you want with that. The next thing is we have an integer for the price range, and the price range is essentially set to whatever the difference is between our low price and our high price. Um, so it's an if else statement here. The else is probably not necessary, but this is just in the case of an error when I was troubleshooting, but probably I can just comment this out right now. So I'll do that and I'll remember that I did that just in case there is a problem later. Um, so basically it's if high in ticks is greater than low in ticks, which in all cases it is, then the price range variable gets set to the difference between the two, high in ticks minus low in ticks, plus one. Now the plus one here, I don't really feel like explaining this. This gives this stuff gives me headaches, but it's basically because these arrays here are zero based. And you know, I can sit here staring at it for a while and it's like, I kind of understand it. I do understand it, but explaining it in words is a whole nother thing. So let's go on. The next thing is I've initialized here an array of type unsigned integers and it is set to the, the size of it is set to the number of integers in the price range. So for example, if our price range is 10 ticks, then our array will be a, a size of 10 basically. And we're also initializing each of the values in this array, all two values of zero. And that's what these little squiggly brackets are doing right here. This one gave me a headache for a while. I had no idea why the array was printing these garbage values. And then I realized you actually have to initialize them to zero um, so that they don't print those garbage values. All right, so I have the array and this array is going to be used to save the volume at price elements for each one of our prices in our price range. And then we're going to examine those later on to determine the point of control and the value area low and value area high. So as you can see here, this is a lot of problem solving we're doing here. And this actually gave me a headache for a while. Um, so the next thing is we have this stuff, which is basically checking. Now, again, I have to give a shout out again to Frozen Tundra, who is pretty much my coding mentor, because if it were not for him, I would not know how to debug stuff like this. Basically, in Sierra Chart, in order to debug stuff, you have to print your values to the log to make sure you're getting the right values. Basically, the, the message object dot format and then printing out things one by one is the manual way of debugging to see if you're getting the right values. And honestly, I've been able to hash my way through 
these things just by simply printing stuff to the log and just analyzing the data. Is it the right value? Is it not? If it's not, then I'm seeing an error there and I test one thing and then the next and then eventually I get through it. And then here we are making this fucking video explaining it. So fine. So, you know, this stuff is commented out now, but basically this was just to check and make sure everything's right with our highs and lows and then check if our array is good. We had to initialize the values in our array to zero manually or it was gonna be printing garbage values. That was one thing I learned. And then here we have a variable for the new price just to print to the log in the following uh, for loop here. And then we have our for loop, let's play with the VAP container, okay. So we have another for loop here, which is a four bar loop. So bar index is still being set to update start index, which was previously initialized to array size minus four, which is four bars in the past. So we're gonna iterate through four bars. So now we have our volume at price container here that we're declaring, I guess, this object. I don't know all the technical terms. Um, but basically this right here is a pointer to a volume at price container. And then we're, we're calling this function here that's gonna be getting the data from the VAP container, okay? So in our four bar loop, we have another for loop here that is iterating through our price range in ticks, starting from the lowest price in ticks, and it is finishing on the highest price in ticks. And for each one of those iterations, it is getting the VAP element for price if exists. And it's wrapped here in an if statement, meaning that if this returns false, we're not gonna get anything and it's just gonna skip to the next iteration, the next price point. So that's fine. We're not gonna be getting any VAP elements for prices that don't exist. Okay, so if you take a look at this for loop here, this is also something I worked on that I researched a little bit. This for loop here actually has two variables in it and only one condition, which is I is less than price range. And for every iteration of the loop, we're actually incrementing two variables instead of one. So that was also something that I found pretty cool. And so this is, so this is what's happening here. So we're incrementing price and price is set to the low in ticks because we need to provide this function with an actual low in ticks uh, value so that it spits out the VAP elements for that price. So we're incrementing that for every iteration so that this function gets the VAP elements for every price in our price range. And we're also incrementing I, which is going to be our array. So basically every time this function returns a, a VAP element, we're gonna be saving it to one element in our array and then on the next iteration we'll be on the next element of the array. So we're incrementing I in this case. So once this for loop is finished, if you look at the array, it contains all of the um, volume at price elements for the prices in the price range from the lowest to the highest price, okay? We're also appending to the array here because we wanna get the total volume for the four bars combined. That's how my profile is designed. The for loop on the outer end is iterating through one bar at a time. So basically when we get to the same array element, it's gonna append to that array element uh, the volume of the next bar. So basically this results in getting the total volume at each price for the four bars combined. And that's basically what this profile here is set to show, all right? Then we have this, which was just to print to the log to make sure we're getting everything correct, but probably that variable can be commented out at this point. And now that we have all the correct values in our array, I promise they're all correct because I checked them a thousand times, we can go down here and now we can play with our array and save certain variables and basically get the values that I was trying to get. The first one is the volume point of control. This one was actually pretty easy to get. So you go through the array and you determine which element has the highest uh, value. Whichever one has the highest value comes out of this for loop here as the variable element and you get the volume saved to point of control volume. I do need this one as well for calculating the value uh, high and low. Again, we have more variables just being declared and initialized to zero. So for integer i equals zero, i is less than price range. So we're iterating through our price range again. If point of control volume is less than the value of array element i, then point of control volume gets set to array element i, and element gets set to i, which is the actual 
element number in the array. What essentially happens here at the end of this for loop is the element is going to be printing out the element starting from zero, um, which price is the point of control. So in this case, it would be zero, one, two, three. In this case, element three would be the point of control and the volume being printed would be 804 or 894 in that case. So I've uncommented one of the printing to log statements and I just wanna show you guys here some of the values that we get. We can see here the price of the point of control that I've converted back into a float, which in this case is 5475, you can see it right there and the volume of that point of control as well. In that case, 1512 right there, now it's 1647. So actually all these values here are coming from the VAP container directly and I'm referencing them against the actual volume at price indicator in Sierra Trip to make sure we're getting the right thing and we are getting the right thing here. So that's good. And you can also see our value low and value high um, that are printing out as well and they are matching pretty well with the one in uh, Sierra Chart. Okay, so let's go back to the code to show everything. All right, so once this for loop is over, we have our point of control and our element of our point of control. That was pretty much the easy part. The next part was getting the value area high and the value area low of our profile. And this one kind of gave me some problems for a few hours uh, here and I had to think about it quite a while and uh, lose some sleep over it, which is fine. That's the way it is. So the first thing is I figured out what exactly I had to do, of course, and then I implemented things one by one. So what we have here is another unsigned integer variable called value area volume. And we set this to the total volume, which I forgot to tell you guys about, but basically this variable here, total volume, we're appending to that every single element of our array. And we're just getting the total volume of the entire profile because in order to get the value area, you need to have the total volume of the profile you wanna get the value area for. So this is what this is doing right here, total volume plus equals array element value for whichever element we're on. We're just adding them all together here with the plus equals here and we're saving them all into the total volume variable, okay? So then we're using the total volume variable here multiplied by a percentage that we're gonna use for the value area. In this case, I chose 75%, but you can choose whatever you want, all right? So now our value area volume is going to be set to whatever the volume times 75% is. So if your uh, total volume ends up being 1,000, your value area volume in this case is gonna be set to 750 based on what I've done here, okay? So I've initialized this to be 750. And now this is important because we're gonna use this variable to check if we have reached this threshold, if we have reached our threshold, then it means that the value area high and low have been found and we have to exit the for loop that's coming up here that I'm gonna show you guys, okay. This right here is just converting the point of control price back into a float so that way we can use it to draw on the chart and do other things with and save it and all that. And then this was just comments I was writing just to uh, do my calculations. Now, as we go down here, we have more variables being initialized for the calculations we're gonna do to get the value area low and value area high. So variables to save value area high and low. Right here, we're starting by initializing them to the price of the point of control. Because in the worst case scenario, if there are no prices in the range, they're just gonna end up there anyway, so it's fine, right? So we just initialize them there. Value area high equals point of control price. Value area low equals point of control price. That's where they start. Okay, so we have an unsigned integer again, and we initialize this one to the point of control volume. Basically, this is our volume count. That This is what we're gonna use to check against our value area volume to essentially break out of the loop when we have exceeded the value area volume threshold. So we start by initializing it to the volume of the point of control because that volume is already part of the value area, so we're starting by initializing it to that, okay. Next, we have two variables, which are integers counting up and counting down, and we're starting these at array element of the VPOC, one tick above it for count up, and count down is starting one tick below the VPOC. So if you remember, our variable element is saved to the array element in the price range that is the VPOC price, okay? So count up starts from element plus one, countdown starts from element minus one. Now we have our for loop. So again, we're iterating through the price range another time. Now this one, guys, 
was hard, but I got through it and I'm pretty happy we, we succeeded with this. And the code is actually pretty minimal if you look at it. I mean, we have a couple of continue statements, but I mean, this is pretty much very minimal if you look at it. Um, and it's certainly a lot better than having 20 subgraphs on the chart. It's just a for loop, finds the value area high and value area low and draws them with a line. That's what I've done here at the bottom here. Just draw them with the line just to check them for now, okay? I know I'm not explaining you guys the use case behind this, right? I'm not explaining to you how I use the value area high and low in the point of control. I'm just explaining to you how I got them, okay? So bear with me, guys. I know some of you have questions like, why are you getting these values and what do you do with them, et cetera. Of course, that's not what I'm talking about here, okay? So the first thing in our for loop here is when we reach our volume count. So basically when volume count has reached or exceeded the value area volume threshold, we break out of the loop and our variables for value high and value low will be set to those prices on the chart already using these functions right here. Right, so that's the first thing in our for loop. When we get to the top of our for loop, it just checks if we've exceeded our volume count. If we haven't, then it continues and checks these things. Okay, so there's a few cases here that I had to check for. The first one is if we're at the top of the range or if we're at the bottom of the range. And the reason I was having some problems with this is because I was um, incrementing count up and count down. And sometimes I was getting these garbage values printing. And what I realized is that sometimes it was basically incrementing to a price point that wasn't there. And then it was appending to the volume count a VAP container that essentially wasn't even there. So I was getting garbage values anyway. So I've succeeded in getting past that, thankfully. These two if statements here are responsible for when our counters count up and count down have reached the absolute top of the price range or the absolute bottom of the price range. And uh, they have sort of specific cases uh, as to what happens there, okay? And then basically if none of those return true, then we end up at this one, which is essentially the basic calculation for getting the value area, which is this. So if array element count up, which is one tick above our VPOC, plus array element count up plus one, which is the next element above that one. So basically uh, one tick above the VPOC plus two ticks above the VPOC, the sum of those two. If that is greater than the sum of one tick below the VPOC and two ticks below the VPOC, then what we do is our value high gets set to that price in ticks. So low in ticks plus count up. We append the volume at that price point to our volume count, and then we increment count up. If the opposite is true, so if the count down plus count down minus one is greater than count up plus count up plus one, then we go here and we set our value low instead to be the low in ticks plus count down. We append the volume of countdown, which will be the price below the VPOC, we append that volume to our volume account, and then we decrement countdown because in the next iteration, we're gonna be checking if the next two prices are greater than the two prices above the VPOC, right? So whichever two prices have the greater sum are gonna be added to the value area on the bottom side or on the top side, okay. And remember this here is only gonna get triggered if none of these are true because these are very important that we don't get any garbage values um, appending to our volume count, which will break everything basically. Um, so right now we're working good. I'm grateful to the code gods, the, to the Sierra chart VAP container gods that we managed to get through this here. So that's it pretty much. And you can see we have these continue statements here that basically um, that once these things happen here, either the if or the else will be triggered, we break the loop and restart it. Because in either one of these cases, one thing here is gonna be added to our volume count. And one thing is gonna be also incremented or decremented. And then once that happens, we don't wanna be checking the um, if else at the bottom here. We wanna restart the loop because now there's new conditions to be checked every time. All right, so <laughs> that's my explanation of this insane logic um, for getting the value area high and low. And as you can see, we made it guys, we did it. We succeeded in getting the value area low and high of our four bar loop. Rock and roll. Hopefully this motivates you to solve more savage problems on your end. Please do not call me to solve your problems. Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye.